Corey Richens is currently in a hearing right now. And if you guys don't remember who Corey Richens is, she is the book author who wrote a children's book to help grieving kids deal with losing a parent. And in her scenario, she lost her husband and, you know, the father of her. I think she has like two or three kids. But uh, she's currently, you know, about to go into trial possibly because um, she's accused of poisoning her husband with fentanyl by giving it to him in a Moscow mule. And she was also reportedly having a house party that same day when her husband passed. And yeah, I don't know. Things aren't looking good for her, but uh, we'll see. Um, I want to listen to this detention hearing that's happening right now. And we are behind, but we'll listen to it in like maybe 1.25. It's a little bit too fast. I'll slow it down and I'll try to adjust accordingly. So I hope you guys are having a good day and uh, hello, hello. We're going to listen to Corey Richards' attention hearing. And thank you so much, Court TV. April of this year, this case is an active case and the investigation is ongoing. Detective, what was the sheriff's office first involvement in this case? No captions because it's live right now, but um, hopefully the audio is clear and good. Hi, Jaron. How are you doing today? On March 4th, 2022, at 322 hours, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call regarding an unresponsive male in the Francis area. Have you listened to that 911 call? Yes. Who placed that call? The defendant, Corey Richens. In addition to saying <clears throat> that uh, someone was unresponsive, did Ms. Richens, the defendant, identify who was unresponsive and anything else about that person's condition? Hey, guys. Yes, she stated that it was her husband, Eric Richens, that was unresponsive, that he was cold to the touch and not breathing. Did EMS and police respond to that address? Yes. Is that the family home? Yes. Was a portion of the police and EMS response captured on police body camera video? Yes, it was. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. On that video, what time does EMS pronounce Eric Richens dead? 0358 hours on March 4th. So that's Corey Richens right here. Um, apparently, she, sa she served her husband a Moscow mule. Um, she said that she left the bed in the middle of the night to go 10 with her kids. I think she said that like one of her kids meant to have a nightmare or something. So she stayed with the kid and she didn't realize that something had happened to her husband until later on. And then when she came back to the husband, um, he was already deceased at that time. And that's when she had called 911. Now I forgot what was like some fuzzy things about, oh, wait, hold on a second. Fuzzy. It's good. I know. I wish I had captions in here. I'm really sorry. They don't have the captions on right now. But um, where is she from? I'm not quite sure. She might be from Utah. I have to look it up. She hired a locksmith to draw open her husband's. Oh, and another thing. Um, apparently, she had tried to change her husband's life insurance policy beneficiary. Um, but lo and behold, she didn't know. Her husband changed it. I think either changed it back or just changed it to his sister. So when the husband passed, I believe that she, a lot of the stuff, a lot of his assets, his money... Um, weren't even going to go to her because he had to change everything and it was going to go to his sister, his family and stuff like that. So I know she was battling out in court for a little bit against his family. What, if anything else, does EMS say about how long he had been dead? One of the EMS personnel made the comment that he had been dead a while. Yes, Utah. Did the state medical examiner's office conduct an autopsy of Mr. Richards? Yes, they did. Have you reviewed the medical examiner's autopsy report? Yes. And the toxicology report that's part of that? Yes. What did the medical examiner identify as the cause of death? Drug intoxication with the specific drug being fentanyl. I'm going to now ask you, detectives, some questions about someone with the initial CL. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say CL? Yes, I do. Oh, the drug who dealer. Is CL in relation to the defendant? Right? CL is an associate of the defendant. Uh, she cleaned houses for the defendant's business, as well as her personal home at times. Does CL have a criminal drug history? Yes. Is she under supervision in a different county, a county other than Summit County? Yes, she is. And is that in relation to certain drug charges? Yes. Does the program... Her lawyer looks evil. Hey, don't be saying stuff like that. Come on. If her lawyer says some stupid shit, we'll call her out on it. But yeah, don't be making fun of her, man. Come on. Does the court program Wait, which she's yet. in monitor treatment and she looks fine testing, to me. et cetera? Yes. Do you know how CL is performing in that program? Based on my interactions with CL, she is progressing through the stages of that program. Um, and that oh, CL is a she. Her personal outlook on her recovery is optimistic. Have you interviewed CL in connection with this case? Yes. Approximately how much time have you spent interviewing her? 
over the course of multiple interviews, several hours each, I would say upwards of 10 hours. Was CL in uh, custody when you interviewed her? Yes, she was. Was that interview captured on video and audio recording? Yes. What, if any, promises did you make regarding C or to CL regarding her cooperation with being interviewed? CL was not made any specific promises, but at the outset of our interviews, we explained to her that her cooperation in our investigation would result in us working with the prosecutors that were responsible for the charge. And just a reminder, I just looked it up for a reminder. Um, she has three kids, three sons, um, nine, seven, five years old, who lost their dad and possibly might lose the mom too. This is just, I don't know, it's just a fuck situation for their kids. I feel so bad for them. She was facing. Did you express to CL the seriousness of this case as well as the charges she was facing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we expressed to her the, the seriousness of the charges and the, the possible results of those charges. As well, we impressed upon her the importance or the value of her testimony in this case as, as it related to the charges that she was facing and that her testimony or any information that she may have was more important to us. Did you stress to CL that the information um, you were asking her about needed to be credible and verifiable? Yes, we, we told her at the beginning of our interview that any information that she may have, we would need to corroborate in order for it to be of value to us. Did CL cooperate with being interviewed? Yes, she did. Did CL know Eric Richens? Yes, CL told us that during the time that she spent cleaning the Richens' home, she got to know Eric, that she felt that he was a really good person, she liked him, and she was very saddened to hear that he had passed away. Did there come a time when investigators executed a search warrant on CL's home? Stacy yes. Castor? Never heard of him before. Is that recent? In that warrant, did you make any observations consistent with CL's testimony that she felt bad about Eric Richens' death? Yes. Inside the home, we identified a bedroom that belonged to CL. In the bedroom, there was a mirror above a desk. Uh, on the mirror were taped or affixed several inspirational quotes uh, that seemed to relate to her recovery and her drug court program. Amongst all those uh, inspirational quotes was a newspaper clipping of Eric Richens' obituary. Did you get the impression that part of the reason CL cooperated is because she felt bad for Eric Richens? Yes, in fact, she said so many times in our interviews. Jeez. Detective, I want to turn now to what, if anything, CL told you about the defendant requesting uh, that CL purchase fentanyl for the defendant. What did CL tell you? In our interviews, CL told us that in early 2022, the defendant reached out to her either by phone call or text message requesting that she procure fentanyl for what the defendant reported was a investor who had a back injury. And upon the defendant asking CL to get fentanyl, what did CL do? CL told us that she reached out to an acquaintance of hers, acquaintance one, and requested that she introduce her to somebody that could sell her fentanyl. Did Corey Richens have like a burner phone or something like that? Or was she doing this on her main phone and she thought deleting text messages and calls would be sufficient from them being able to track everything back to her? Did she at least have a burner phone? Hi, Bleep, how are you doing today? Allegedly, uh, third time she tried to poison her husband. I know that like, I think the husband's family has mentioned that the husband had some sort of like, they went on vacation. The husband had like some sort of like, he, he got really sick and for some reason, the husband was like, oh, my God, I think my wife tried to poison me or something, which is like really odd because like what kind of relationship would you guys have? You know, why would you want to be with someone if you thought they would try to poison you every chance you get? By God's sake, I'd just be like, hey, maybe I have food poisoning or something. But yeah, allegedly, um, it's what the family, uh, the victim's family has said. But, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Did acquaintance one introduce CL to someone that could sell CL fentanyl? Oh, what love were yes, you? CL said that acquaintance one provided her with a phone number of another acquaintance, acquaintance two who was someone that she knew could sell CL fentanyl. And did CL say that she ultimately contacted acquaintance two? Yes, she did. What, if anything, did CL say about purchasing fentanyl from acquaintance two? CL told us that she contacted acquaintance two after receiving his phone number and asked to arrange to meet to purchase some fentanyl from him. She stated that sometime in February, she believed uh, she met up with acquaintance two at a Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased from him 15 to 30 round green-blue pills, which she understood to be fentanyl. <laughs> this is why I stay single. Listen, 
when you watch true crime and stuff like that, don't let it apply to your daily life, okay? The stuff that happens in true crime, it doesn't happen often, okay? I mean, depending on what case it is. But like in cases of like murder, poisoning, assassinations and stuff like that, um, you know, you have a very high chance of not happening to you. So there are a lot of like pluses in like, you know, being in a relationship and stuff, Tiny Ghost. So don't let it deter you, okay? She's definitely bringing back the shoulder pads. Look, last time I wore shoulder pads was when in ninth grade. I actually went to um, the clothing store recently and there's this blazer I tried on. They all had fucking shoulder pads on and they look weird on me. I don't like shoulder pads. Um, let's see. So, hey, Tay. Uh, sorry if you already talked about this, but did you see the newly released photos of Lexi uh, very clearly pregnant? Uh, can you link it to me? If you're in my Discord, just link it. I might have seen them. You think that he would never take another drink or meal from her again. But here's the thing, though. Like, they live in the same household. He's the mother of their of his children. And I, what are you going to do? Like, keep avoiding, like, everything that she makes? Drinks? And I, it's it's tough. <laughs> so, I don't know. We'll have to see if there's any evidence of the husband having um, any inclinations that, you know, his wife has tried to poison him in the past. Or maybe it's just, like, some talk from the family. But, yeah, we'll see. Too many crazies out there. Hi from Greece. Hi, Anna. How are you doing today? How's it going? Oh, there's a demo there. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, maybe I'll try it out. Records through the course of your interview with CL, were you ultimately able to narrow down on what that date was in February that CL purchased fentanyl from acquaintance to at the Maverick and Draper? Yes, based on uh, forensic evidence, we were able to determine that that date was February 11th, 2022. What, if anything, did CL say about what she did with fentanyl pills that she purchased from acquaintance two. Seal told us that after purchasing the pills from acquaintance two, she returned home to her house in Heber. She said that either later that night or the next day, the defendant met her in the driveway of that home and did a hand-to-hand -hand exchange of pills for cash. Jeez. I'm gonna turn out detective to some questions. Wait, did I miss it? Is she, is she even close with CL? Because if CL was just like some person, like maybe like a acquaintance who you happen knew to sell drugs, like why would you expect CL to keep your secrets for you? You know, why would CL be like, oh, by the way, like, you know, yeah, I didn't sell her for any fentanyl. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I don't know why she would think that CL would keep her secrets for her. Like if they were like super, super close, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But are they even close or just like acquaintances? Um, regarding witnesses who corroborate CL's testimony, okay? Okay. Hey, Nightwolf. You mentioned acquaintance number one. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance one? Yes. Rain. <laughs> Have you reviewed body camera audio and video of that interview? Yes. Does acquaintance one corroborate CL's testimony? Yes. She stated that CL contacted her in early 2022 and asked for someone that could sell her fentanyl. In the body cam, she also retrieves her cell phone and shows investigators the messages that corroborated that. Sorry, my hair's what kind of messages were they? They were messages between uh, Acquaintance 1 and CL on Facebook Messenger app. And have you reviewed those messages? Yes. Is the first of those messages dated February 6, 2022 at 1.37 p.m.? Yes. Does it read, text me, I've got a question, won't do it on this? Yes. And that's CL <coughs> writing Acquaintance 1 asking Acquaintance one to text CL because she didn't want to write over Facebook Messenger? Correct. Did Acquaintance one say whether or not she ever, in response, uh, contacted CL? Yes, she said that she then either texted or called her sub subsequent to her request. You testified that Acquaintance two sold fentanyl pills to CL at the Maverick and Draper. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance too? Yes. Have you reviewed body camera audio and video of that interview? Yes, I have. I'm surprised she ain't got a note pen and she ain't doing any writing. Usually they like to do a little bit of writing of their own. Also, wow, the gallery's really packed back there. Is acquaintance two able to co corroborate CL's testimony? Yes, acquaintance two was able to recall that he sold fentanyl pills to a friend of acquaintance one's in early 2022 at a Maverick gas station in Draper. I'm going to turn out detective to some forensic data questions um, and whether forensic data corroborates CL's narrative, okay? Okay. Oh, from ABC? Um, really? Where? Have you reviewed carrier records of the defendant's phone? Yes. And I want to just clarify one thing. I'm talking right now about carrier records different than cell data records. 
Um, we'll have an expert testify about cell data records in a moment. I'm just gonna ask you about the carrier records, okay? Okay. Um, what, if anything, do the carrier records for the defendant's phone, um, or what, if anything, in the carrier records for a defendant's phone corroborate CL's testimony? The, the cell records from the defendant's phone show several phone calls back and forth between her and CL in early 2022. Do they show any text messages back and forth between the defendant and CL? Yes, several. Have you reviewed those text messages? We were only able to see the timestamps and who the sender and receiver was. We are not able to see the content of those messages because they appear to be deleted from both the defendant's phone and CL's phone. Oh, but can they recover it? Uh, didn't you read a children's book about losing a parent that is on Next Level Crazy? Yeah, so after her husband um, died, um, she decided to help her kids grieve by writing a children's book with her kids. And um, yeah, that she went on like a little, I don't know if it was like, she went on like one book tour thing uh, where she like showed up on like the, um, there's an interview that was online. And she was like talking about the kids book about how like, you know, it's like tough for kids to lose a parent and stuff like that. But then later on, like I think a year later, <laughs> a year later is when they arrest her and accuse her of murdering her husband with fentanyl. Was the greed worth it? No, it's like, I don't know. It's like, I can't believe how people can be so short-sighted. Um, and then also let's say, let's say like, you know, she, let's say like, you know, um, she doesn't get convicted, right? What's gonna happen is if she gets custody of her kids again, there's gonna be a huge rift between her kids um, with her with the mom and the other side of the family. I don't know. I feel like their family's just kind of it's, it's it's pretty ruined. It's gonna be really hard to repair things, you know, because um, I'm sure as hell the victim's family they're probably gonna think that she did it for the rest of their lives. Have you reviewed the call history and carrier records of CL's phone? Yes. Does CL's carrier records and call history corroborate CL's testimony? It was actually the same day, Rain. Yes. Is there a particular um, set of calls on February 11th, 2022, between 5.19 p.m. and 6.52 p.m. in CL's phone history? Yes. Did you question CL um, regarding those calls? Yes. She said those calls were to acquaintance too, and that they were to arrange the specific date and time to pick up fentanyl in Draper. Turning now from CL's purchasing fentanyl for the defendant to the defendant's purported timeline on the night of Eric Richen's death, okay? Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier that police interactions with the defendant were captured on video. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. Did the defendant provide police with a written statement in the early morning of March 4th, 2022? Yes, she did. Corky, did her drawing attention to herself get her in trouble or is she already being investigated? You mean like her writing a book? Did it draw attention to her case and then people were like, oh, something is like iffy with it? I mean, I'm assuming that there was already something iffy that the police were kind of like, hmm, and maybe like the victim's family as well had suspicions about her um that probably made her you know become the um the subject of investigation so i don't know if it's the book itself but i don't i think it was just there's probably already something that was like kind of going on in the side the reason why they investigated that would make sense to me um he had changed life insurance received from his wife to his sister and didn't tell the wife yep man imagine doing all that and then she tried to go you know they tried she tried to go to court to battle it out um apparently like some news outlet was reporting that um the day that her husband died, uh, she was celebrating like getting a house because she was like doing like investment real estate or something like that. Like she flips houses or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, like apparently she was like throwing like a like a party in this new house and some of the guests didn't even know that her husband had passed that same day, um, which is wild. And uh, they were saying that um, I think like his sisters like showed up or something and they got like some sort of like altercation um, that may have gotten physical. But yeah, I don't know. That was like, there was like a couple of news outlets that uh, reported that. Hey, Johnny, how are you doing today? How's it going? Have you reviewed that statement? Yes. What on the early morning of Eric Richen's death did the defendant report had happened that evening? She stated that the last time that she saw Eric alive was between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. She stated that before going to bed, they had had a drink together to celebrate uh, closing on a house for her business. She said that they got in bed between 9.30 and 9.45 and that shortly after getting into bed, one of the children had a nightmare and that the defendant got out of bed and went to be with that child in their bedroom and slept in that bedroom until 3 a.m. or around 3 a.m. when she woke. She stated she returned to her own bedroom, got into bed, and 
felt that Eric was cold to the touch. She stated that she turned the light on, saw that he wasn't breathing and that he didn't look normal and that she then called 911. Because I wonder if like, let's say this goes to trial, right? I wonder if her defense then would be like, oh, okay, well, I did get the fentanyl, but I actually got it for my husband. And, you know, my husband was the one that took the fentanyl that night. He decided to put in his Moscow meal and he did it to himself. I wonder if she's going to take that route. Um, because if she does, would it be hard for the prosecution to prove that she was the one that drugged him? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm like trying to think that like, you know, how, how else would she, um, what are some different ways that the defense is going to, you know, what are they going to do? And um, yeah, how she would be acquitted if she gets acquitted. Uh, chicken problems, your girl out for the true crime and distraction. Oh, no. Are your chickens OK? Are the kids OK? Um, well, the kids, I'm assuming, is probably with the deceased husband's family, probably. But I mean, mentally, they're probably like, we don't have mom right now. We don't have dad. And yeah, it's probably really fucked, you know. And uh, they're, they're pretty young, too. Like, even though, like, the youngest one is like, I think, like, was it five years old? You still have some general understanding. Like, hey, like, why are my parents not around? Right. So. Did the defendant say whether anyone else was in their home other than the defendant, her husband, Eric Richens, and their three young children? No, she stated no one else was in the home. They interviewed a witness and he had no drug use, occasional THC, gummy. Turning now to the defendant's statements regarding whether she performed CPR on her husband, okay? Okay. Uh-oh. Um, that was a CPR thing. Did the, did the defendant tell investigators when they arrived at her home shortly after she called 911? whether or not she performed CPR on Eric Richens. Yes, she reported that she did. Oof. Remember, with Murdoch, Murdoch said that he tried to attempt to, like, check the bodies, the pulses and stuff like that, but then when law enforcement arrived, they were bewildered that he didn't have any blood on him, any on his hands, really, on his shirt, on his shoes, or anything like that, right? And then remember with Sarah Boone, when Sarah Boone called 911 um, because she found her husband in the suitcase, um, they were like, hey, like, Try doing CPR and you can tell that like in the voice, she sounded like she was so resistant. Like she was like, I, I, this guy already dead. I don't need to do CPR. But I think that like after like the second time when the 911 operator was like trying to convince her like, oh, you know, try CPR or something. She's like, oh my God, he gurgled. Oh, and I think that's fake too, by the way. But um, yeah, um, I, I guess they're going to try to say that like, hey, she'd even attempt CPR. I'm going to refer to someone now as defendant's best friend. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. What, if anything, did the defendant tell her best friend regarding whether she performed CPR on Eric Richens? Investigators found text messages between the defendant and her best friend that uh, was her explanation to her friend that she conducted CPR on Eric prior to EMS arrival. And do those text messages read, I pumped so damn hard, so hard, screaming at him to come back to life? Yes. You testified earlier, Detective, that EMS responded. Have you interviewed the uh, first EMS responder? Yes, I have. I'm sorry. Uh, it's at 1.5. I guess we'll just slow it down just to watch her reactions. I don't know if you guys are, like, interested in watching people's reactions. I pumped so damn hard, so hard, screaming at him to come back to life. Yes. I'd be very curious to watch the um, police interviews. I don't think that's up anywhere, though. You testified earlier, Detective, that EMS responded. Have you interviewed the uh, first EMS responder? Yes, I have. What observations did that EMS responder make? They told me that when they arrived, they began CPR compressions on Eric, and that upon beginning those compressions, Eric began to foam at the mouth. He stated that that observation indicated that CPR was not likely conducted before he arrived. I don't know, Tiny Ghost. I don't think so. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you look into whether Eric Richens used illicit drugs? Yes. What did you determine? Based on the interviews that we conducted with those who knew Eric well, um, all stated that he did not use illicit drugs other than consuming THC gummies on occasion. Do those that you spoke to include Eric's two best friends that he's known since high school? Yes, both made the same statement, that they never knew Eric to use any illicit substances other than the THC gummies. When I reference a hunting... See, so she can argue. She can be like, well, you know what? I knew my husband the best. His friends, his family, they didn't know him very well. You know, he had secrets behind closed doors. Like, I don't know. I'm just trying to think, what are, what are some things that she's going to try to say uh, to combat this? Died in Mexico by the initials um, TR. Do you know who I'm referring to? Yes. 
Did you speak to this hunting guide? Uh, other Summit County detectives did, yes. And what did this hunting guide, if anything, say about Eric Richens using illicit drugs while hunting in Mexico? The guide told detectives that several of their clients, when they come to Mexico, will seek out someone that can put them in contact with illicit substances while they are down there for their hunt. He stated that Eric Richens was not one of these, that Eric was solely focused on the hunt. Has the defendant made any statements regarding whether her husband, Eric Richens, used illicit drugs other than THC? Yes, in several statements made by the defendant throughout the investigation, there have been at least 10 times that she- <gasps> Oh, hey, Chanley Painter. Let's see, do I recognize anyone else back there? I don't, but Chanley Painter, hello. She has said that Eric does not use illicit substances and did not use illicit substances. Um, how could she have benefit from him dying? Um, well, the guy was pretty um, rich and they're saying that the possible motive is like, you know, get rid of the husband and then, you know, take over um, all his like assets and money and stuff like that. Uh, that's, that's, I think is like the, the motive that we're, we were thinking. And just to be clear, hey, other, Betty. Than, other than the THC company is correct. On the night uh, Eric Richens died, did investigators search the Richens home? Yes. Did they find any illicit drugs? No. Did they find any paraphernalia or packaging or other evidence of illicit drugs? No. Did they find fentanyl anywhere in the home? Only that which was in Eric's body. Mm, not looking good, Corey. Not looking good. Hey, Morden, how are you doing today? Uh, Corey Richens, we talked about her a couple weeks ago. She's accused of murdering her husband um, by giving him a Moscow meal that had fentanyl in it. After his death, um, they were saying that she threw a party that very same day, uh, celebrating buying a new house that she was going to flip. And uh, she wrote a book to help her kids grieve. I think she wrote a book with her kids, you know, and uh, she went like on a like a TV interview talking about it. And yeah, a year later, she got arrested for um, the alleged murder of her husband. So that's where we're at. Chanley is always dressed like she walked out of the devil words brought up. <laughs> True. She's always so fashionable and stuff. I, I don't know. I'm too lazy to dress up like that. And like, it's so expensive. I don't know. I like my t-shirts. <laughs> Although I should go shopping soon though. I feel like um, my friends see me in the same stuff every time. They're just like, oh my God, can you just wear something else? These shirts are fun, okay? I'm going to now shift the uh, detective from the night of Eric's death to a second drug buy initiated before his death and concluded after his death, okay? Okay. What, if anything, did CL tell you about the defendant approaching CL a second time for fentanyl? CL told us that approximately a week after delivering the first load of fentanyl, the defendant reached out to her again by text or, or call and said that she wanted some more fentanyl that was stronger than the previous batch. And in, in response, what, if anything, did CL do? CL told us that she again reached out to acquaintance one um, because she had lost the phone number for acquaintance too. And again, wait, I, so I forget, um, I should know the answer to this cause I did read the arrest report. Um, so she reached out to CL twice to get fentanyl. The first one was it like two weeks or something. And the second one is the one that she, I guess may have used to, um, possibly poison her husband with. Um, but the first batch, did she just buy it just to make it seem like, Oh, Hey, this is just gonna be a casual thing. Like me purchasing fentanyl from you. Or did she already had been accused of may maybe trying to poison with fentanyl before and it was too low of a dose and it didn't work and that's why she's trying again. Um, do you guys know that? I feel like I should know the answer to that. They might've brought that up in the rest report. Again requested from acquaintance one that she provide her with the phone number for acquaintance two. She also made other statements in Facebook messages uh, regarding that request. In your interview or detective's interview rather with- Hi Patty. One, did she corroborate that indeed CL reached back out to her asking for acquaintance two's phone number? Yes, in the same Facebook Messenger, it, it showed the two different contacts on the two different dates. And does the second Facebook message, um, was it dated February 25th, 2022 at 9.40 p.m.? Yes. And does it read, I need those again, but more, and I don't got a ride, I lost your friend's number? Correct. Did CL and acquaintance one both say that acquaintance one provided CL's CL with acquaintance two's phone number again? Yes. What then, if anything, did CL do with acquaintance two's phone number the second time? CL told us that she again contacted acquaintance two and arranged again to meet up at the same Maverick gas station in Draper to purchase again 15 to 30, this time blue round pills that she understood to be fentanyl. Between, uh, on the way to the Draper and Maverick, the second time, when she purchased 15, I'm sorry, did you say? 15 to 30? Yes, 15 to 30 pills. Which she believed to be fentanyl. Did she make any stops along the way? Yes, CL told us that the second time that she procured fentanyl for the defendant, 
she did not have a vehicle to drive on that date. She said that she reached out to a friend, acquaintance three, and asked that he give her a ride to go purchase fentanyl. Okay, I found the arrest warrant. Let me just read bits and pieces really quick just so I can remind myself and you guys too. Okay, so here's is what she said she, uh, happened. Defendant told law enforcement that when she left her room to go to her child's room, she left her phone plugged in next to her bed, did not take it to her child's room. However, between when the defendant said she went to the child's room and when she called 911, status on her phone shows that it was locked and unlocked multiple times. And there was also movement recorded on the phone. Oh, no. In addition, tolls on a defendant's phone shows that messages were sent and received during that time. Those messages were deleted. Are they able to recover this? Following an autopsy, uh, they found, yeah, five times the lethal dose um, fentanyl in the system. Uh, this is her getting the, the drug from CL. So, yeah, so she did try to get the drugs uh, the first time, but I guess we don't know what happened to it. And then two weeks later, she contacted CL again to get more drugs. Okay, because I wonder if she was trying to, maybe she purchased the drugs previously just to like establish a relationship to see if she can get it or if she had already tried to do this before. But okay, all right, keep watching. She said that he did pick her up, that they traveled from Heber City to the defendant's home in Francis, where according to CL, the defendant had told her there was a check waiting under the mat at the defendant's home. She said that she checked under the mat and didn't find a check. And so she knocked on the defendant's door and the defendant came to the door and wrote her a check from her business, from the defendant's business, for $1,300 for the purchase of the fentanyl. CL told us that afterwards, they drove to the America First Credit Union in Heber City, where, the, where CL banks, and cashed the check and deposited $300 of it into her account at America First Credit Union. She said that after stopping at the bank and getting the cash, they then drove to the Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased the pills from acquaintance too. Did investigators execute a warrant at the America First Credit Union um, Yes, and that warrant returned a copy of the check written from the defendant's business account in the name of CL and a receipt that shows that it was cashed and that $300 were deposited into CL's account. And then CL ultimately, being driven by acquaintance three, went to the Draper in, sorry, went to the Maverick in Draper and purchased fentanyl a second time from acquaintance two. Correct. What, if anything, does acquaintance two say that corroborates CL's testimony? Acquaintance 2 in his interview stated that he remembered selling fentanyl to a friend of acquaintance ones on two separate occasions at the same Maverick gas station in Draper. He also Sorry, I'm looking up right now so I can answer your question. Um, who asked that? Oh, where are you? Patty says, what's a detention hearing if she will get bail? Uh, that's what it seems like. Yeah, I'm reading this news article right here. So uh, they're going to listen to some witnesses. And then from that, uh, the judge is going to determine whether or not she gets bail. And um, if that is denied, she has like 30 days to appeal it. Okay. Oh, oof. <laughs> sorry. I paused it in a, in a not a really good spot. Hold on. Uh, let me fix this really quick. <laughs> said that he remembered the second time that hey, Holly. he sold her the pills that CL was with another person who matched the age and gender of acquaintance three. Have you interviewed acquaintance three? Yes. What, if anything, does acquaintance three say to corroborate CL's testimony? Acquaintance three corroborated all the same details that CL told us about that day. And in fact, showed us text messages on his phone, but also corroborated that story. Detective, I'm gonna ask you now some questions about what are commonly known as bug out bags, okay? Okay. Um, did investigators execute several search warrants on the defendant's home or the family home? Yes. Um, did those warrants identify what are commonly known as bug out bags? Yes, there were several uh, duffel bags stored in the garage, along with a backpack sized day packs, and each was identical and labeled for a different member of the Richens family. Um, those backpacks were seized subject to a warrant and were inventoried and photographed. Inside the bags, uh, detectives located several items that would be useful in an emergency situation, um, but the most interesting were tr uh, documents needed for travel for each member of the family. Uh, each bag contained a photocopy of a state issued ID in the children's case, along with uh, passports for I gotta pull Eric up. and the defendant as well as global entry travel cards for both Eric and the defendant. Hey, Diamond. Did those bags also contain clothing, toiletries, that kind of thing? Yes. Thanks, Dixie. Did detectives know when those bags were packed? No. And there was a bag for Eric as well, is that right? Correct. I have no further questions for you. Mr. Lazaro, I'm mine. Thank you.
Oh, here comes her attorney. Damn, she's tall. Does anyone know any of the attorney's names yet? I don't. I'll just call her Miss Attorney Hi. for now. Detective, o it's O'Driscoll, right? Correct. Good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna follow a little bit the, the same timeline just so or we kind of keep things uh, together. Uh, you said you reviewed the body cam uh, that was provided on the night uh, that Eric passed away, correct? Correct. Okay. And that uh, Corey made a statement that night to police, a written statement. Correct. Okay. And she told them that she had made a drink, correct? Correct. Okay, so they were aware of that. Um, okay. Was there anything in that body cam or investigation uh, that talks about them looking for a glass that a drink had been made in? No. Okay. Um, but you said that they searched for illicit drugs, correct? I don't know if they searched for illicit drugs, but they searched the home. Okay. So they searched the home that night, knowing that he had a drink right before he went to bed, uh, and made no note that they had recovered glasses, looked for glasses, anything along those lines, correct? Not to my understanding. Oh, did they never get the Moscow meal glass that had the fentanyl in it? That is one tough looking uh, lady. Yeah, she kind of reminds me of a, a little bit of a dummy mommy vibes. <laughs> um, you also testified that when you interviewed CL, she was working uh, on both a personal and I'm gonna say professional capacity for Corey, correct? Correct. And she was cleaning houses um, that, she was both cleaning Corey's personal home and then she would clean homes uh, that were uh, investment properties, correct? CL told us that she cleaned both homes for Miss Richens' business. Are they gonna try to pin it on CL? Is that where she's going? Like CL has access to Corey Richens' home and her properties. Oh, no, oh my God, where are we going with this? As well as at another time frame, she cleaned their personal home. Okay. So not necessarily at the same time. But at the time she was cleaning homes for the business, correct? Which time are you referring to? Uh, on or about. I don't know, maybe we'll have some evidence that they can show to be like, hey, you know, it wasn't Corey Richards, it was CEO who did this. Uh, so I'm the getting time leading up to or <laughs> during your investigation, end of the year, end of 2021, beginning of 2022. At, at that time, from my understanding, what CL told us, she was cleaning only investment Welcome properties back. belonging to the Richards Realty Company. And she was getting compensated for that, correct? Yes. Okay, and so the check that you issued the search warrant on for the bank, that was written from Corey's business account, correct? Correct. Okay, so it could very well be that Corey was paying her for cleaning houses, correct? Oh, okay, I okay. I don't want to speculate, but... It could be, it's despite possible. what CL said, correct? Okay. Um, you also testified that um, CL was progressing through her drug court program, and, and you were optimistic about how she would do in it, correct? No, I testified that she was optimistic about her own I'm personal sorry, recovery. That. Oh, did I mishear that? She was only cleaning the investment properties? Oh, I must have misheard, sorry. How long uh, were you investigating CL? When did you begin investigating CL? I don't know an exact date, but the beginning of 2023. And were you monitoring what she was doing at that time? Yes. Okay. Um, because you knew she had a boyfriend or this guy in Vegas, some other details about her life, correct? Uh, initially at the outset of investigating CL, no, we didn't know all those details. But over the course of your investigation, you learned them? Correct. Okay. Did you, you have CL's phone, correct? Summit County Sheriff's Office evidence texts do. Did you review it? Yes. Okay. And you testified about text messages between CL and the defendant uh, on or about this time period you're looking at in February, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you uh, review any other information prior to that time about contact that CL and the defendant had had? Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, just to answer someone's question earlier. So after, this is the arrest affidavit. After receiving the information regarding the toxicology, a search warrant was obtained for Eric and the defendant's residence. During the service of the search warrant, defendant's phone and several computers were seized as evidence. Uh, warrants were obtained for the electric devices and the information from the devices were downloaded. When investigators downloaded the defendant's phone, several communication between the defendant and CL were located. Okay, so that's how, <laughs> that's how they found out about CL. Um, they were able to get a search warrant get her phone or devices, computer, whatever it was, and uh, that's how they found the connection. Eesh. I'm unsure. Did you even look? it's possible that we looked into communications. In, in this investigation, initial stages, we looked into communications with everybody that the defendant had been communicating with. Okay. But you don't, you don't recall, or you didn't look for a pattern of communication between CL and the defendant. Hey, Paul. Fact? You were focused on February. I guess that depends on what and what stages of the investigation you're talking about. I'm talking about any of them. Did you ever look and see if CL and the defendant texted each other about anything on a regular basis? Yes. Okay. And how far back did those go? I'm not sure on exact dates again, but into 2021. Okay. 
So for a period of time, because CL is working for the defendant, there's communication, correct? Correct. Hey, Mrs. Smith. Sorry, I was reading chat really quick. And how far back did those go? I'm not sure on exact dates again, but into 2021. Okay. So for a period of time, because CL is working for the defendant, there's communication, correct? Correct. And nowhere in the communication between CL and defendant are there any text messages asking for drugs, correct? We didn't find any, but there were also gaps in time frames in the phones okay. when we looked at them. Now, I want to also talk about, you said you didn't make any promises uh, to CL, is that correct? Correct, no specific promises. Okay. <laughs> right. Shush. Shush a bush. <laughs> Her eyebrows are a little bit, you know, they're a little bit sharp. <laughs> You did, however, tell her, let me back up. When was the first inter interview you had with CL? I believe it was April 28th or 26th. Okay. I believe it was the 26th. Did you have any contact with her prior to that? No. Did anybody from law enforcement have contact with her prior to that? N not from our office. You don't know if anyone else talked to her? I don't. Okay. Now, part of this uh, came out of a raid or, or something along the lines that was coordinated with at least ATF and some other agencies, correct? CL's home was subject to a search warrant based on information that we had gathered during our investigation into CL. Okay. And that search warrant would essentially contradict that she was doing well and what she was supposed to be doing in drug court, correct? Oh man, so they don't have text messages well at the at right now, but they don't have text messages asking of her asking CL for drugs. So I guess right now their star witness is gonna be CL and the defense is gonna try to destroy CL's um image when if she ever testifies up there, right? I wonder, oh man, if CL changes her mind and doesn't testify or changes her story, I wonder if that's just gonna completely destroy the state's case. She was buying drugs, wasn't she? We didn't know that. We knew I don't know what the evidence they people, have. We knew had active warrants for drug charges. Okay, and that would be a violation of drug court conditions, correct? From my understanding, yes, but I don't know the details of that. Okay, and as part of that search warrant, were uh, individuals arrested? CL was arrested, yes. There were other individuals who were arrested too, correct? I'm not recalling other individuals that were arrested on the date that this, the warrant was served. Okay, were any drugs recovered at the home? Yes. Okay. And you also recovered a firearm uh, from Seal's bedroom, correct? I don't, I don't know. It seems like they don't have a text message. I thought these were text messages. Like when I read the arrest affidavit, I assumed that there were um, communications that they had that was, <laughs> that was uh, concrete. But now that I'm looking at it, it could also just be CL telling the police, oh, this is what happened. I don't know. Correct. Correct. And that would be a violation of her drug court conditions, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, in this first interview in, in April, you begin the interview. By explaining to CL essentially how dire of a situation she's in, correct? I don't have the interview memorized, but I know we talked about that, yes. Okay, well, you told her that she was on probation to drug court for four first degree felonies, correct? Correct. Okay, a violation of that is a potential prison sentence, correct? It would depend on the prosecutor, but that's potentially true. Okay, a first degree felony carries a possible penalty of life in prison, correct? Hey, Rush, no, huh? the code. What's up? Um, so you also, so you told her she was facing problems with that, correct? That right. this would be a violation. So she'd be on the hook for four first degree felonies. Potentially, yes. Okay. And you also told her that having the firearm um, could potentially be a new crime, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you also told her that the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, was essentially on board with screening uh, drug distribution charges, correct? Oof. So the defense is going to say, hey, you know what? CL had a bunch of pending charges, but maybe, maybe she decided to throw Corey Richards under the bus just so she can get out of it. I'm happy to play it if you don't remember. Play it, play it. Specifically. Okay. Do you remember talking to her about potential federal <laughs> charges? Yes. Okay. So she was aware that not only was she facing multiple first degree felony prison sentences, she was also potentially facing federal charges, correct? Correct. 
And during that initial interview, she tells you uh, <laughs> that she didn't buy fentanyl, correct? I don't know if she made that specific statement, but she she talked about not knowing anything about fentanyl. Okay. Ooh, we're going to be playing some tapes. About an hour and 19 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. And that interview ends about, with you telling her, well, several times you tell her to think through all of this. God, okay, sorry, I just ran a psycho. I don't know how she's doing this in heels. Holy shit, I used to wear heels, like, all the time. Dude, it fucked up my calves. It fucked up my back. I can't, I hate fucking heels. <laughs> I don't know how she wears heels right now. If I'm wearing heels, it better be on my feet for, like, five minutes at most, and I'm sitting down most of the time. But, oh, my God, I can't do it no more. I think the question about the text was about the previous messages, so maybe they do have something about the fentanyl. Hi, everyone. Did she plead a not guilty? Hey, Justin Rogers, how are you doing today? Well, it's a go win. And let you know she wants to help, correct? Yes, I gave her the opportunity to tell us up front whether she was willing to cooperate or if we should just not bother interviewing her anymore. Okay. But this is after you essentially tell her that she has the potential of doing a considerable amount of state and federal prison time, potentially. Yes. This yeah, is I don't a know if we're there yet. in law enforcement to be able to leverage charges for information. Okay. In fact, you did in this case leverage charges for information because you told her that you didn't care about first degree felonies or federal charges. What you cared about was information about Corey getting drugs, correct? I told her that I was yeah, interested I don't think in information that she may know about this case. Okay, and, but you told her also that Eric died of a fentanyl overdose, correct? Correct. And you told her that you thought that Corey gave him the drugs, correct? I did not specifically say that. You alluded to the fact that you needed information about Corey getting fentanyl because that's how Eric died, correct? Hi, Richter. I don't know if I made that specific statement, but the information that we tried to convey to CL was that we wanted to know the information that she may have regarding Eric's death. Okay. And you didn't care about any additional charges all you cared about was that information, correct? As I said previously, we expressed to her that the information that she may have was more valuable to us than seeking charges against her. Okay. All right. And then you interview her two more times, is that right? No, there were, I believe, three more after our first one. Okay. Were all of those uh, audio and video recorded? Yes. Okay. And those were turned over to uh, the state in this case, correct? The correct. state being the prosecutor's office? Okay. Now, <clears throat> forgive me because with all these interviews, I'm not sure which one comes from which. Oh, Richter, I don't know. Were you here when we talked about this? Um, it was a couple weeks ago. Um, she is the one that wrote a children's book. Um, about grieving, um, especially about your parents, I believe. And uh, about a year after her husband died, she was arrested for uh, allegedly poisoning his fentanyl, his um, uh, Moscow meal with fentanyl. And uh, that's where we're at right now. Uh, you, in subsequent interviews, tell CL that she needs to give good enough details that will ensure that Corey gets convicted of murder, correct? I don't know if I made that specific statement, but I did express to her that the information that she gave us needed to be specific enough that we could corroborate it and that it could be presented to a courtroom. Okay. And that she was, quote, screwed at this point for a minute or a few years if there's not cooperation, correct? No, I never made such statement. Okay. Did you ever tell her this was her get-out-of-jail-free card? No, I did not. Okay. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Oh, get the receipts! Get the receipts! Now, at some point, CL tells you that, in one of the interviews, that Corey contacted her between December and February to obtain prescription pills for an investor, correct? Correct. Okay. And she doesn't specifically state fentanyl at that point, correct? Are you referring to CL? I'm referring to CL. I don't remember, but I don't believe so. Okay, yeah, we're getting to the text message and the fentanyl now. You had a fentanyl patch and had a bad reaction to it. I'm never touching fentanyl again. Thank God I did, though. That's all I need. That's all I need is a, a fentanyl addiction. Wait, a fentanyl patch? Uh, who is she crossing? Um, Detective J.O. Driscoll. Um, okay. In fact, in, I'm guessing it's something where on the second or third interview, um, CL says that those first pills... Well, it never says those first pills are fentanyl, correct? It never says that Corey asked for fentanyl, correct? I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? Sorry. In, in, in those first, in the, the first transaction, okay. so initially CL tells you that there were three transactions, 
prior to Eric's death, correct? Yep. Yes, and what I have to say here is that... Well, I mean, that was a yes or no question. But none of the information that we got from CL was perfectly chronological. We had to piece it together over multiple interviews to come to the conclusion we came to. Because you told her you needed more something more specific to ensure that Corey gets convicted, right? No, we told her that we needed more details on what she was talking about and specific dates and times. Okay. But in the first one, she says there's three transactions prior to Eric's death, correct? At, at some point in our interview, she told us there were three total transactions. Okay. And she says that Corey was only looking for prescription pills or hydrocodone pills, to be specific, correct? CL referred to them as Roxy's. Okay. What do you know Roxy's to be? They can be different things in the drug world. They can either be counterfeit Roxy pills Cody? that are meant to look like a prescription pill, or they can be actual prescription pills, but generally they're known to be opiate-based. No, that's not the prosecutor. Uh, this is Corey Richens, the defendant's uh, attorney, defense attorney. Uh, drugs, whether illicit or pharmaceutical. Okay, so something along the lines of hydrocodone or oxycotton or something along those lines, correct? It could be, yes. Okay. And she specifically says that she was looking for $900 worth of fentanyl pills, correct? I don't know if initially, but she did make the statement of $900 at, at one point in one of our interviews. Okay. And she says that... Corey told her to leave the pills at an outdoor fire pit at the Midway House, where there was cash, correct? I don't know if she made the, that exact statement, but yes, she told us that at some point in part of the exchange that she was instructed to leave pills in an outdoor fire pit in a house in Midway. Okay. And in fact, you sat there with her in this interview and did house searches, correct? Trying to figure out which house this was. Yes. Okay. Because um, she couldn't really tell you which house it was, correct? She couldn't give us an address, but she was confident that she could find it if she could drive there. Oh, Morticia. I love Morticia. Um, any updates? Um, I haven't heard any updates. Um, I don't think so. I haven't seeked for anything either. I've been off the internet for a little bit, but uh, I don't know if you guys have any updates. Let me know. Um, the only thing that I was looking at at the time was um, I was Googling around and I found there was like a Reddit and uh, that's how I found those videos. But yeah, um, nothing. I haven't heard anything else about it. Nothing yet. Usually I kind of keep my eyes on law and crime and uh, court TV. Yeah, it was made all my muscles cramped up. Ooh, painful, chronic pain. Oof. Okay. And did you take her for a drive there? Yes. Okay. Did you ever do any follow-up investigation on uh, whether or not that house uh, ever sold? Yes. Okay. And you know that that house sold sometime in January of 2022, correct? From what I understand, yes. So Ms. Richens no longer owned that home or <coughs> occupied that home or had access to that home in February, correct? I don't know. Well, the house was owned by somebody else, right? Again, I don't know. Well, you said it closed in January of 2022. From the information that I was told from other people, other investigators that had looked into that, I was told that Ms. Richens owned the house at some point and that it sold at some point. I don't know dates exactly. Hey, don't you think that date would be important if uh, CL's telling you that she had access to the home and was there in February? Possibly. That might be a good fact to know. CL then does subsequent interviews, correct? Yes, we had multiple interviews with her. Okay. Um, and... Hey, Chopper Lily. Yeah, possibly. Hi, Sarah. After being told that she needs to be more specific, as your words are, correct? She now says that uh, it was specifically fentanyl that Corey asked for, correct? Correct. <laughs> and that she didn't actually take the pills to that house in Midway. It was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, correct? Like I said, she went back and forth on her memory on which instances referred to which transactions. And ultimately, she told us that she was sure that the first, the first transaction of fentanyl was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in her driveway. Okay. And was what's been referred to as acquaintance three, was that in regard to that transaction? No. Okay. It was the second transaction. Were you ever to corroborate, was anyone with her that could corroborate that she saw CL hand Corey drugs? Not that I know of. And then she states that now there was a third transaction that occurred after Eric's death, correct? She didn't make the statement that it was after Eric's death, but she told us there were three total transactions. So the information contained in the state's amended information, you don't know where that came from? Which information are you That she from? purchased drugs after Eric's death? Yes, I do know where it came from. Okay. Um, and you're saying CL did not sell drugs to Corey after Eric's death? CL could not remember specific dates and did not make mention that the transaction happened after Eric's death, but when presented with digital evidence from other witnesses, she confirmed that that was most likely correct. Okay. So she.
that's what I heard, Trapper Lily. Um, I heard it was a lot cheaper. So they they cut they cut um like instead of getting like heroin or something like that, they just cut it with like fentanyl and stuff. Disagreed with your scenario of events, correct? No, in fact, several times during our interview, she told us that as we presented her more information, it helped her remember more. Okay. So as you're telling her to be more specific, you're providing her with information that you're gaining in the case, and she's saying now I remember. Accurate? Yes. Also testified that you interviewed uh, two of Eric's best friends, right? Yes. Okay. And during one of those interviews, man, she's a scary cross examiner. So I'm going to go back to, to CL for just a second. On this transaction that you alleged that this check was used for, or the state alleges this check was used for, you testified that she picked up the check that was written on Corey's business account and cashed it, right? Correct. And drove to the Maverick and purchased fentanyl. She didn't drive, but she was. Someone drove her, yes. okay? And, and the person with her corroborates that. Correct. Uh, and that, that third witness never saw CL give those drugs to Corey, correct? Acquaintance 3 never saw that? Acquaintance 3 didn't tell us that he ever saw that, no. Um, in fact, there's no independent witness to corroborate that CL gave Ms. Corey those drugs, correct? No eyewitnesses that we have identified, but the investigation is ongoing. Correct. And CL is currently out of custody, right? Depends on your definition of custody, but she's not incarcerated, no. Not incarcerated, just on, I think, Eagle Monitor and not to leave the county, right? Correct. But following your interviews with her, she was released from jail? Not immediately, no. She worked with the prosecutor in the other county where her drug court is and came to a resolution as to those charges against her. And part of that was being released on income monitor. Okay, so in exchange for the testimony, or in, not testimony, in exchange for the information that she provided to you, and a deal was worked out where she was placed, essentially released from jail on the order to show cause, correct? I don't know the specifics of what went on between the prosecutor and CL, okay. but subsequent to our interviews, we reached out to the prosecutor's office and let them know that she was being cooperative. After that, I was not involved in any decisions regarding her release. Okay because that's up to the judge and whatnot. But, but you did communicate that to prosecutors? Yes. That she gave you the information you needed? That she was being cooperative with our investigation, yes. All right, I want to turn now to your interview, and, and I'm going to use initials, are you okay with that? Okay. Um, you had an, an interview with um, one of Eric's friends. Uh, his initials are JS, do you recall that? Yes. Okay. That interview occurred about April 20th, is that correct? That seems right, I don't know a specific date, but. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. This case might depend on how well CL does on the on the stand. Uh, if this goes to trial, how well she does on the stand and how well she does on cross-examination, if she's consistent or if she's going to buckle under pressure. And during that interview, he discussed, or you discussed with him, um, that he and another individual were essentially Eric's best friends, correct? Ms. Lozera, my apologies. Yes. April 20th of which year? Oh, 2023. Three. I apologize. Thank you. Um, at any point during that interview, did J.S. mention uh, that Eric had said that at any point during he and Corey's marriage, he was concerned that uh, Corey was attempting to poison him? I don't recall, but I don't think so. Okay. In fact, you present him essentially three scenarios of what could have happened to Eric, correct? That he potentially did it to himself, knowingly, that someone else did it to him, uh, or that it was accidental, right? Okay. And you specifically ask him if he thinks Corey would have done it, and he says, no, in my gut, I don't believe so, correct? I don't know if that was a direct quote, but yes, he said that he didn't believe that she would have done it. And he also states during that interview that at the time of his death, Eric and Corey's marriage was in a really good place. Yes. Correct? Now, he also details or, or talks about um, a falling out that he and Eric had had uh, over the course of their friendship, correct? <laughs> yes, that sounds familiar. Okay. And that Eric and his other friend uh, that he refers to in this interview actually had a falling out right before Eric passed away, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, also talk about, uh, or he talks about uh, the fact that, you know, all three of them at different times had had marital problems, that they had helped each other through, correct? JS told, told me that 
he and Eric and their other friend would confide in each other uh, about their marriages and uh, would share information. And that was, that was how he had the insight that he had into to Eric's life. Okay. He also talks about um, that Eric changed uh, or created these trust documents, correct? Correct. Okay. And his understanding, based on what he said that Eric told him, uh, was because <coughs> Eric was pissed or upset um, about a relationship that Corey had had, correct? Or he thought he, she had. I don't remember the specifics of that that part of the interview, but I do remember that JS was aware that Eric had made the trust. Okay. And he doesn't specifically say anywhere in that interview. Um, Corey Richards is accused of poisoning her husband, her husband with uh, fentanyl. Knew that the trust was made because he was mad about this home equity loan, correct? JS expressed to us that he understood that the reason that Eric created the trust was to ensure his son's well-being, if anything were to happen to him. Um, and he also expresses to you that uh, because you asked him why it wasn't changed back or be because the, the sister was made the trustee, correct? And I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The sister, so in those trust documents, sorry, that's a terrible question. In those trust documents, the sister was made the trustee, correct? From what I understand, yes. And you asked JS specifically. Mm-hmm, yep. Um, she wrote a children's book about grief. Um, <laughs> a year after, or a year plus after her husband passed away, uh, she, was, she was arrested or somewhere along the lines of yeah, he did if they were doing so well, why would he have not changed that back? Yes. Okay. And he tells you uh, that it was his way. In the um, arrest affidavit, the medical examiner found levels of fentanyl in Eric's system was approximately five times the lethal dose. Um, the medical examiner stated the fentanyl in Eric's system was illicit fentanyl and not medical grade fentanyl. It's also the opinion of the medical uh, examiner that after evaluating Eric's gastric fluid contents, the fentanyl in Eric's body was ingested orally. ...of ensuring that even if they were doing well at the time, if there was a divorce, he would get the last word in it, right? I, I remember him using that phrase, getting the last word, yes. No, we're not in trial yet. Uh, this is just a detention hearing. Um, judge is going to listen to both sides and then um, determine whether or not she's going to get uh, bail, I believe. Now, you also testified Based today us about researching this the internet. hunt <laughs> that took place uh, down in Mexico, right? Correct. And this hunt was February of 2022, correct? I don't think she's entered a plea yet. I don't know specific dates, but I'm aware that Eric was on know, a in Mexico so. shortly before his death. Okay. I, I don't think we're there JS yet. JS tells you uh, that he was really upset, uh, actually, leading in the days right before he passed away about what had happened with this hunt, right? Yes. And uh, he was upset that they had paid an outfitter uh, for a number of permits uh, that they believed the outfitter had procured, correct? correct? Yes, from what, I'm, from what I'm recalling, he was upset about the outfitter or the guide had not gotten enough permits for the amount of animals that they ended up taking, and it caused some concerns over uh, legal requirements of tagging animals. Okay. And getting the cape or anything else, correct? Correct. And this is the same... Uh, <coughs> is this outfitter the person that you investigated? Or that you interviewed? Someone associated with that hunt and that outfit, yes. I'm not sure the exact association, but a contact for that outfitter. Okay. So that outfitter was aware that they had made some serious problems uh, for Eric with regard to how many animals they took in Mexico, correct? According to JS, yes. Okay. And in your subsequent investigation, uh, you know that Eric had had um, some heated conversations, actually, the night uh, before he passed, or the night that he passed away, with that outfitter, correct? We received information about that, yeah. Okay. In fact, he was searching how far it was to drive from Scottsdale down there, correct? Correct. The Delphi case, um, whatever happens to the Delphi case, the rest is someone we just haven't heard anything else. Is the Delphi case the one with um, two girls that went missing? And it was like caught on Snapchat or something? It was by a bridge near the woods? We were not thinking of something else. Well, his phone showed that search. Okay. And JS also told you that he I might had be thinking information of something else. or believed that this outfitter was somehow connected to the cartel, correct? 
I don't recall. That, that sounds familiar. Wait, hold on a second. We're going to blame the cartel for everything now? Familiar, but I don't recall if those were the words that he used. But essentially, he was... He made, he made a, he, JS made a statement about the cartel when he was talking about Eric in that hunt, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so would you approach for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> Is that everyone's go-to? You know what? At the end of the day, fucking cartel, man. <laughs>